This week on True Crime Travelers. I call it La La Land. That feeling you get when you're on vacation and it seems like nothing can go wrong. When your hotel room feels like a safe haven, a vortex where the outside world just doesn't exist. The darkness of the night wraps around you, cozy, romantic, never menacing. Where time slows down once you slip into a bathrobe and cuddle up with the love of your life amongst hotel sheets. This is La La Land. But sometimes, being in that La La Land mindset makes you the easiest prey. Welcome to True Crime Travelers, where we investigate suspicious murders and disappearances around the world, but from a traveler's perspective. We are Alexa and Amelia, award-winning travel experts and the authors behind the Solo Girls Travel Guide book series. We are obsessed with safety and true crime, but I promise we're not here to scare you. We're here to prepare you. Today, true crime travelers, we are going to Amelia's homeland of Mexico and to a part of Mexico that Emmy knows very well. We are going to Baja Norte, which is basically California South. Emmy, do you want to explain Baja Norte to the people? Yeah, Baja California Norte is a state. It's like the upper part of the Baja Peninsula, that little dangling arm like on the side of Mexico. And it's basically, yeah, California's downstairs neighbors. So it's really easy to jump in a car and road trip from Los Angeles, San Diego to Tijuana, Rosarito, Ensenada, and all the beaches around there. And this area uh, is also known for the lobster. You're going to have the Ugh. best lobster tacos you have ever had in your life. Big, huge lobster tacos with butter and beans <sighs> in like huge flour tortillas. Oh, I would go there just for the tacos. Uh, and you know what? Our couple today, on the last night that they spent together, they did go for the lobster. Mm-hmm. So today we are talking about a young newly married couple from California. And I want to just like kind of put you into the la la land that they were in. Okay. So if you're in a cozy place, you guys close your eyes and follow along with me for a second. Picture this. You're on a tropical vacation with your husband in Mexico. You spent the days drinking in the pool, exploring, eating street tacos, getting massages on the beach. The sun is setting and is painting the sky with shades of pink and orange, and there's not a care in the world. Your only job is to eat, drink, dance, and love each other. Now open your eyes and understand that this was the La La Land that Elliot Blair and his wife, Kim Williams, were experiencing when they arrived at the Las Rocas Resort and Spa in Rosarito Beach. January 2023, and they were here to celebrate their first wedding anniversary. Now, let me tell you about Kim and Elliot. They are both very like, they're like rising stars of attorneys. And that's actually how they met, by the way. Elliot Blair was interning at the Orange County Public Defender's Office the summer of his first year of law school. And that is where he met Kimberly Williams. The two were both hired as deputy public defenders at the same office. And after eight years of dating, the two were married. January 15th, 2022, they made their home in Orange, California, which is where I was born, fun fact, and they bought their dream house. Life was beautiful for these two. So let me tell you about Rosarito. It's located in the northern part of Baja, California, just south of the U.S. border, like Emmy told us about. And quite a distance from like the more well-known tourist areas like Cabo San Lucas. Usually when you hear Baja, you think like Cabo and that's Baja Sur, but we're in Baja Norte. And the town that Elliot and Kim love to go to is called Rosarito. And you guys, it is just a two hour drive from their dream home in Orange, California. So they get to go to their favorite place in just two hours. It is so easy for them to get there. Emmy, so much so that Elliot and Kim, they have been to this resort five times. Five times. Okay. This is like their spot. And they always ask for a junior suite. They always ask for room 308. Five times room 308. 
So, you know, Em, if you've stayed at a hotel, even just two times, but especially five, you know the staff. Yeah. So Elliot knows the staff. Yeah. And he he speaks fluent Spanish. So for him, it's like coming home, you know, and it's their first wedding anniversary. It's a milestone. And they are so welcomed at this resort. And Kim said in an interview, we were just so happy to be there. It was everything we wanted, a break from the world, just the two of us. So the night in question is January 14th, 2023. This is how that night went. Kim and Elliot, they drove out of Los Rocas Resort and they drove a few miles to a restaurant where they splurged on the lobster special. This place is called Villa Ortega's. Okay, so this is like that lobster Emmy's talking about. And they both had one drink. Now, you guys, it's important that we pay attention to how much they drink because this will come to be a really key factor in the speculation of what actually happened in this case. So apparently at dinner, they had one drink. Then they went out dancing at 7 p.m. They went to this restaurant and it has like a live band. And, you know, Elliot's Latino. And I'm going to put a lovely stereotype on my Latino men. A A Latin man that can dance is the most fun. It is the most fun thing ever. So they're at this bar called Splash Baja. And it's like 70s music and they're just having fun. They're being silly. And then at 10 p.m., Elliot and Kim... They got in their car and they drove to a nearby pizzeria. It's a pizzeria near the resort. And by the time they get there, it's like 10, 30 p.m. And Elliot knows the workers and the owner of this pizza place. So they're having the best night. You know, they're like in their favorite little resort town. They go to dinner. They have the lobster. They go dance. They go see their friends. Best night ever. And around 11 p.m., They made their way back to the bar at Las Rocas. So this is at the resort, okay? Mm -hmm. During the 45 minutes that they were at the bar, according to Kim, Elliot only had one margarita, okay? So she says during the entire night, the entire day, they had six drinks. They also watched the sunset like at the pool at the resort before they went to dinner. So they had six drinks over the night. If you have six drinks, how are you feeling, Em? Kind of tipsy, but if you have them like in a long period of time, I guess you're not mm-hmm. that drunk. No, you're spacing them out. And, you know, he's a dude. I'm sure this isn't like his first time drinking, right? And they were eating, right? And they were eating the whole time. They were eating and they were dancing. So they're metabolizing. So he's had six drinks. He is probably tipsy, but it does not sound like this guy is blacked out. By the time they return to their hotel, room. It was almost midnight. Okay. In bed before midnight. Like that's my favorite way to do it. You drink all day in bed before midnight. When they get to their hotel room, Kim is exhausted from the fun of the day. She's really happy. And she's feeling kind of like the weight of the sun and the sea. And she climbs into bed and she starts dozing off. And she remembers as she's falling asleep, Elliot, the ever attentive partner, he's awake a little bit longer. He's kind of like, you know, putting things away. He's getting ready for bed and then he's brushing his teeth and then he'll climb back in bed with her. This is normal stuff, right? Yeah, completely. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but when my boyfriend and I travel together, I always sigh a little sigh of relief when it's pajama time. I feel Mm -hmm. like, okay, we did it. Another travel day without incident, without injury. You know, and we're in bed and we did it, but it never would cross my mind once me and my boyfriend get into bed that more events could unfold. It's like once you're tucked into bed, that's it. Day's done. Yeah. Right. And that's the thing about those final moments before sleep, the feeling of safety, of letting your guard down. The hotel room where Elliot and Kim were, it's a quiet room. The only sound was the gentle hum of the air con and the distant crashing waves. Elliot was not yet in bed, but watching him get ready for bed, Kim felt safe and she drifted to sleep. Now we're going to go back to this picturing. We're going to go back to envisioning how Kim felt. She's in her safe hotel room with her husband, her protector, in a place that they know. 
So imagine her shock. Imagine how she felt when the serene silence of that room turned into something else entirely. In the darkness, in the middle of the night, Kim was jolted awake. There were men standing outside of her hotel room door, which was now slightly ajar, their shadows looming in the dim light. Confusion gripped her. She turned to grab her husband in the bed beside her to say, hey, what's going on? But as she reached over, she felt nothing. Elliot was not in bed with her. Who were these men at the door? Had they taken him? Was he tied up in the bathroom? What was this? What was going on? Then they say, Ma'am, is that your boyfriend out there? Boyfriend, Kim thought. I don't have a boyfriend. Where's my husband? She's still delirious. She realizes that the men at her door were hotel staff. She gets up. She walks towards them. They lead her outside to see what was going on. Disoriented and terrified now, Kim follows them outside. And the scene that she walked into was unimaginable. Her husband of exactly one year, Elliot Blair, who had been warm and alive and brushing his teeth just what seems like moments ago, was now lying cold and still on the cement below. No blood. She doesn't recall seeing blood. No one tried CPR. He was just laying there with people around him. Something had happened all while Kim was asleep. She stood there frozen in shock, her mind struggling to grasp what she was seeing. And then, according to Kim, what happens next throws the entire case into quiet chaos for her. Around 1.45 a.m., she says that the lead investigator steps over Elliot's body And through the interpreter with him, he says to Kim, there's a bullet hole in his head. Kim was still in a daze, her body moving on autopilot as she started being questioned by authorities. The questions came fast and relentless. Where had she been? Where had he been? What did she see? Did she hear anything unusual? Did they think she was a suspect? It seems like it. I mean, it's usually the spouse, right? So they say, did the two of you have a fight? One officer asked her this. His tone was measured, but suggestive, you know. Were there any problems in your relationship? Kim could barely comprehend the insinuations. She was devastated. Her grief compounded by the fact that she's being treated as a suspect in her own husband's death in another country. In the middle of the night, while Elliot is basically wearing pajamas, What is going on? Now, I'm going to just give the spoiler alert here. There was no bullet hole in Elliot's head. No bullet hole, no blood. I was going to say, like, if there was no blood, how could, could there have been a bullet hole? Right. So this is now leading us to see how sloppy this investigation, how sloppy this case, how sloppy it's all going to be, okay? To say a flippant thing like that, on the crime scene, to the wife. So disrespectful, so crazy. But yeah, Kim at this point, though, was still being treated as a suspect. And then suddenly, they say to her, you can go. Here's your wallet. Uh, Go back to the hotel. We recommend you go back to the U.S. and we'll contact you. Almost like she lost a piece of luggage. All the while, they're encouraging Kim to hurry up and get Elliot's body cremated. Which obviously, you know, she didn't do. Kim wasn't just going to cremate her husband's body and move on. She wanted answers. She wanted an investigation. But it didn't happen that fast. So a GoFundMe page was started to raise the money to assist the family with their own investigation. And that GoFundMe raised over $100,000 oh very quickly. I know. So they were able to get their own investigator, but as their own investigator was just kind of beginning, within a week 
of Elliot's death. Even though they weren't giving answers to Kim, Mexican officials released a statement saying that Elliot Blair's death was a tragic accident. Of course they did. They also said, of course they did. And they also said that this 33-year-old man had a very high blood alcohol level. But, 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 according to experts, it takes weeks or months to get the BAC test back, okay? So that statement, that wasn't a fact. That was a guess. You know, they're just trying to paint Elliot Blair as another drunk tourist who fell off his balcony in the middle of the night. Yeah, one more drunk and gringo. Yes, that is the that is the story they're trying to tell. So here is the like kind of official narrative that authorities are spinning. They say that Elliot must have fallen from that third floor balcony outside of room 308. And the hotel, it's more like a motel style for my American friends, where your door leads to kind of this main walkway, like this open air walkway, and there's ledges and there's balconies. So the police say, or the authorities say, that after a night of drinking, he got a little bit too close to the edge, lost his balance, and boom, down he went to his tragic death. Tragic, but an accident. No foul play, nothing to see here. This is the official story. We hear it all the time. But Kim isn't buying it. Are you buying it? Absolutely not. I don't think I'm buying it either. We're going to break this case down bit by bit, and I'm going to tell you some more information after this quick break. Want to travel with us? Every summer, Amelia and I take small groups of women away from the daily stressors of life in what we call river therapy. Imagine whitewater rafting in the most stunning locations across the USA, completely off the grid for up to five days, designed specifically for women who need a soul reset. Bring your stresses, anxieties, and fears, bring your dreams, wishes, and goals, and join us for river therapy. Go to alexa-west.com and click on Glow Up Travel to join our next trip. Okay, Emmy, the Mexican authorities are calling Elliot's Blair death a tragic accident. But his wife, Kim, celebrating her one-year anniversary with her husband, Elliot, isn't buying it. And neither is Elliot's family. We see this happen so often. We just did the case about Scarlett Keeling in India. And I mean, you remember the police said that there were no signs of foul play, but when her mother got to the body, the body was covered in bruises, 50 bruises. Do you remember? Yeah, that's what like local authorities love to say. They would just want to protect the reputation of the places. I agree. And it's a lot easier to brush tourists away because their home country, they're eventually going to go to their home country. You know, Mm -hmm. it is really complicated to fight a case in another country where there's red tape. There's a language that you don't speak. There are systems that you don't understand. So they're hoping that when they say it was an accident, that you'll just say, okay, and walk away. Yeah. And sadly, in Mexico's case, and I'm sorry to say this about my country, but when it comes to police, there's a lot of corruption involved. Yeah. A lot of corruption. But the police, they didn't know who they were dealing with. Kim, Elliot, they're these incredible attorneys that are loved and beloved. They have a community behind them. So if they thought that they were going to be able to brush these two away, they had another thing coming. So let's now imagine again that you're Kim. Imagine that you are Kim. You are in another country and the love of your life, your travel partner, your safety, the person that makes the world seem like it makes sense, has just died in the most mysterious, gut-wrenching way possible. And you are alone, no less. Fun fact, Kim and Elliot, the night of Elliot's death, they had met another couple in a bar and they got along so well, they exchanged numbers. So Kim, in the middle of the night, calls this woman that she had just met in a bar like four hours earlier, and is like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, my husband, whatever. Could you imagine having just met someone in a bar and getting a call that they're panicking in the middle, 
Isn't that crazy? That's wild. But at the same time, it is a testament to the fact that when you meet another traveler, you instantly become allies. So I am very glad that she did have someone there. She had this this other couple there. Travel friends are real friends. Travel friends are real friends. You actually go through shit. And like I pray to God that no one ever goes through a death with a travel friend. But anyways, so she's in Mexico with the police, the paperwork, and the ultimate horror. The fact that she has to now leave Elliot's body behind because it is part of an investigation. Imagine walking away, imagine going to the airport, getting on a plane, knowing that he's still there, alone, cold, in the morgue. That is a pain that no one should have to bear. This is literally my worst nightmare. Like my safety brain when I'm traveling with you or with Tim, I always like think about like, how do I keep you guys safe if something goes wrong? And now- This is literally my worst nightmare too. Yes. So now even worse, Kim has to sit on that plane without Elliot's hand in hers. She has to go home alone. I have chills. Like, yeah. (laughs) So this incident happened in January, 2023. And since then, Kim has done what she can in terms of a media tour, telling anyone who will listen that something is seriously off about what happened that night. She says, Elliot wasn't careless. He was careful, thoughtful. There is no way he just fell. Kim is convinced that there is more to the story. Something sinister that either the police missed or are covering up. So what is the real story here? Was this just a tragic accident? Or was something darker going on? I've got the 911 records here, and we're going to start breaking down a timeline, okay? So according to the 911 records on that night, the first call came in at 12.50 a.m. It was resort staff. They called and they said, a person has apparently suffered a fall. They called it a fall. So the first person on the scene says someone has apparently fallen. Around 1.10 a.m., the paramedics arrive, and they immediately declare that Blair has no vital signs. At 1.15 a.m., this is when the other detective gets on the scene, and he makes that careless, flippant comment about a bullet hole in his head. And that's basically all we have, is that that happened, and then police swept Kim up into this whirlwind, And she was sent back home without him. And they wanted an autopsy. Remember the police were like, hey, maybe cremate the body. And she's like, no, we want an autopsy. But it took almost a month for them to get Elliot's body back to Orange County for the autopsy. And when you think of an autopsy, what do you think of, Emmy? Like, what does that look like? Like The, how do you call them? Forensic doctors? Like, analyzing everything in the Mm -hmm. body. What substances were in it? Are there any bruises? Any signs of... Uh, attacks, I guess. Right. So I was confused when the autopsy is also talking about the crime scene, because I usually think of an autopsy as just talking about like the body on a cold table under harsh light with someone like investigating it. But Uh the autopsy in this case, they mention the crime scene. And is that normal? I don't think so. I mean, I'm not an expert, but according to every crime show I've ever watched. Yeah. I wonder if like the coroner was on the crime scene in order to get details of how the body was found, because maybe that's just like an extra layer of then understanding what you're working with when it's on the table. But apparently this autopsy mentions that there was blood inside the bathroom of the hotel, suggesting that they think like, okay, either he was bleeding and then he left the room or that he, something happened outside and he came back and he bled. But I don't believe they ever tested this blood and matched it to Elliot. They said it was like a reddish brown color, which means that it's dried. And if it's dried, it's probably just really bad housekeeping. Ew. Right? Ew, right? So I have read that. And I know that people in the true crime community have talked about that. But that's my take is like, I do not think that Elliot was bleeding inside. And if he was, it would have not been ride right and also it makes no sense like oh he there was blood in the bathroom but we're not gonna match it to the victim i know what else did the autopsy say 
it said that he had sustained 40 fractures to the back of his skull, as well as road rash on his knees and a toe injury, which makes his family believe that he was dragged, you know? You don't get 40 fractures in your skull from a third story. Right. And it's the back of his head. So if it's the back of his head, you would think then that meant he was sitting on the balcony and fell back. Maybe. Is it possible that while he's falling, he tried to like hold himself with his leg and that's what got gave him road rash and hurt his toe? Maybe. Or maybe he fell onto, like he hit something before hitting the ground. But it was a really clear fall, directly clear fall. So there was nothing in his way. It doesn't make any sense to me then. No. So this is what the autopsy says, is that 40 fractures, road rash, indicating that he was dragged. And the toxicology report, you know, the the Mexican authorities were saying, oh, he was wasted. Blair's body had been embalmed in a Mexican funeral home for a month, which makes it really hard to get toxicology tests. However, yeah. they were able to get a clear test, and they said that his blood alcohol level was just 0.1, which is right around, right above the legal limit, right? Just 0.08 is the legal limit. That is only two points above the legal driving limit. He was not drunk. But I also wonder, does that BAC level, does it fall over time? I'm looking it up. All right. I'm asking, does the BAC level lower in a deceased body over time? The answer is no. The BAC level in a deceased body does not decrease over time the way it does in a living person because the body stops metabolizing. So this was his legit BAC level. Point one. So he was not just another drunken gringo. He was not just another drunken gringo. That theory is done. That theory is dead. I'm furious. I'm furious. That is debunked. So we know now that Elliot was not drunk, but he was wearing his jammies. He was just in his boxers and a t-shirt and socks, which is what his family says he sleeps in. Mm -hmm. And somehow he went from his room to the cement below his room. How did that happen? And why would he be outside if he was about to get into bed? I know. If he was going to go out, okay, it's time to play detective, M. Let us activate detective mode. Okay, Emmy, what is your theory? I could see you like really speculating. I could see the whole time. I think we need to ask the question, what if it really was an accident? My thought is, what was he a smoker? What if he was like, oh, I'll have one last smoke before I go to bed. Mm. So we, he went outside. And then he just kind of leaned on the rail or the balcony and fell to the ground. Right. So I'll put a photo of the hotel on truecrimetravelers.com so you can see what we're talking about. And the ledges at this motel, they weren't high enough, in my opinion. They weren't high enough. Like, here's the thing. When a ledge is lower than your waist, it can make it surprisingly easy for your torso to become like top heavy, especially if you're leaning over or maybe looking out at the view or just like resting your hands somewhere. That is like a surefire way to fall off a balcony is if it doesn't hit you at the right spot. 100%. And yeah, I mean, that can happen. The autopsy doesn't make a lot of sense though. So that's what makes me not really believe this theory, but I think it's a really valid question out there. I think... With the autopsy that they said he had these scrapes and 40 fractures to the back of his skull, it sounds very violent, but it also just could have been that he was sitting and he fell back, right? Oh, wait, I have a light bulb moment right now. They have their own private balcony. If he wanted to go out and smoke Emmy or go like look at the sunset, he would have gone on the private balcony. Oh, Why did he go out the front door? This makes... Yeah. Then this makes even less sense. Okay. Well, I have a crazy freaking plot twist that is going to lead us into theory number two that might make this make sense. Bring it. Bring it. 
But we will do that right after this quick break. Persons of Interest is back, and it's bigger than ever. That scream will echo in my head for many years. Taser, taser, taser! She's gonna shoot! Oi! Shot fired! Shot fired, shot fired! Stay out, you gotta go on you! He had the, the perfect aim. I am absolutely stressed at that point. I have no idea where my officers are. Persons of Interest, available everywhere you get your podcasts. Hi guys, Emilia here. So, fun fact about me, I have been visiting Baja since I was young. And to this day, it is one of my favorite places in the entire world. I have seen baby humpback whales learning how to jump. I have swam with whale sharks and sea lions and even baby sea lions and gone scuba diving through incredible shipwrecks. And I want you to experience it too. I am so excited to announce our brand new guidebook, The Solo Girls Travel Guide to Baja Sur. Forget the crowded cabo scene. This guide takes you straight to the heart of Baja's most secret beaches, roadside taco stands, and hidden gems. So go to truecrimetravelers.com and click on the Solo Girls Travel Guide, where you can find our new Baja Sur guidebook along with the rest of our Mexico collection, created to help you travel with less fear and more fun. I honestly feel like a monster that I've hidden this from you and our listeners for this entire episode. But there is something that happened in the timeline of the day that I didn't tell you. Okay. There's another theory out there that Elliot and Kim might have been targeted for a robbery. I mean, think about it, right? They were staying in a resort that's known for attracting American tourists with money. Gringos. Gringos, yeah. Maybe someone thought that they could make a quick buck. Maybe they followed them home from the resort. Maybe, maybe Kim and Elliot were being a little bit too flashy, or maybe they said something to the wrong person about, you know, having a lot of money, or just the fact that these are two lawyers from California who have been down there five times. Maybe that put a target on the back of being like, these people, we can rob them. They're robbable. Yeah. They're robbable. And maybe someone tried to rob them in the room. Maybe Elliot resisted, things got violent, and maybe he was pushed off the balcony. But who are the the suspects? Who would rob them? It could be anyone, right? Like a disgruntled hotel employee, a local thief, or even maybe a local police officer. Because get Mm -hmm. this. 90 minutes before the couple returned home that night. You know, they had driven a few miles down to the restaurant and then a bar and then a pizzeria. On the way home, they had a run-in with the police. Elliot and Kim were pulled over by the police for allegedly rolling through a stop sign. That's a really easy thing to say like, oh, we saw you back there. You did this thing. So we got to stop you. This wasn't your typical traffic stop in the States. The officer didn't issue a ticket. Instead, they asked for a bribe. Normal? A mordida, we call it. A mordida. Like a bite. A bite. Tell me more. Well, sadly, this is a common practice uh, when it comes to police in Mexico. It's fairly, like, if you get pulled over for a ticket, they're going to usually be stalling for you to be like, oh, no, no, like, let's just settle this. Like, we can figure this out. And you just, like, give them some money on the side instead of then them giving them giving you your ticket. But wouldn't the better thing for Elliot be to just take the ticket? Yeah. I I mean, I've every time I've gotten pulled over, the few times, I've been like, yep, give me the ticket. Now, how, wait, how, many times, how many times have you gotten pulled over? I think, like, a couple, just, like, driving. Uh, one time in Baja Sur, actually, because I didn't see one of those like red stop signs, because we don't usually okay. have those in Mexico. We have these in Baja Norte and Baja Sur because because of the Americans. That is such a fun fact. Oh my gosh. You don't have stop signs usually in Mexico, but you have them yeah. in Baja because Americans go down there. So Americans need to know how to drive. 
Oh my God, that's fascinating, Emmy. It is. But sadly, the bribes, like the bribe thing, it is. It is a very common practice with police, especially transit police. And so, yeah, I am not surprised that happened. So, yeah, that is what happened to Elliot and Kim. Now, let's break this down further. If you are pulled over by the police in Mexico, you give them a bribe, you go on your way, right? Mm -hmm. But Elliot, he's a lawyer. He's smart and he is fluent in Spanish. They had a little bit of a back and forth. And the bribe that Elliot paid, he was reluctantly paying that bribe. Did that put a target on his back? Did he piss off the wrong cop on the wrong day? So here's where things get interesting. What if this encounter, this pullover, and this bribe? Is it possible that this pullover, this wrong cop, was the trigger for the murder of Elliot Blair? I think the wrong cop at the wrong time. It sounds oh. like ego, you know? Hello, telenovelas. Yeah, you know, what if Elliot said something that he didn't like and he was like yeah. raging? And here's the thing. Kim isn't fluent in Spanish. so. Kim, she might have thought my husband is being respectful and responsible, but maybe he wasn't. We will never know that. But we have some more questions to answer, Emmy, because if that's our who, what about our how? How did it happen? How did Kim sleep through it all? Let's look at the hotel room, okay? You and I are going to look at the hotel room and we're going to kind of like map this out. Ooh, an activity. <laughs> okay, so Miha, okay. Yeah. I am going to send you a photo of the hotel room. But before I send it to you, I'm going to read the review on TripAdvisor where I got this photo, okay? There is a woman who wrote this review who stayed in room 308. So the photo she posted, we know is the exact photo, okay? I will use a little disclaimer that this review was in 2017, which is six years before, but the, the layout of this room did not change. The layout of this room is the exact same. This is from this lady on TripAdvisor in 2017. Me and my husband, can I read it with a Texas accent? Yes, please. LA, hold on. <clears throat> Activating Texas. Mm -hmm. Me and my husband decided to go on a quick getaway for our anniversary, and we don't have much time for planning. Somebody recommended Las Rocas to us. I immediately, <laughs> I immediately booked a junior suite, and I paid 211 bucks for a two-night stay in room 308 with free American breakfast. It really says that. If you're accustomed at staying at five-star hotels, do not expect much. This is a type of hotel that is old and outdated, but still fine. If they update it, it would be nice. And scene. Okay, so... I, I have, Wait, see. I have a question. Think of me. What's the name of your Texas alter ego? Oh, I saw this movie that I really liked. And it was about this girl, the chubby girl, and she was doing pageants. Dumpling. Dumpling. It would be Dumpling. Okay, can we have Dumpling more often on this podcast? You may please? request Dumpling anytime you want, honey. Okay. <laughs> Fun fact, you guys, I grew up in Texas for the first like while of my life. I learned how to speak in Texas. This is part of me. Okay, so back to this hotel room I just sent to you. This is a junior suite, okay? And I am posting this photo right now on truecrimetravelers.com on the blog of this episode. This is the photo that Dumplin took. Okay, Emmy, open this photo. As we're seeing the photo, the person taking the photo is in the corner of the room. To their left is a sliding door to a private balcony. In front of them is a couch with a table. Next to it, there's kind of a partition and there's the bed. Then you keep walking towards the door to the outside. But before you get there on the left is the bathroom. So let's go back to that night of Elliot's death. Kim would be laying on the bed and Elliot would be in the bathroom. Now, Elliot 
to get to outside does not need to pass Kim. So it is very possible that Elliot in the bathroom opens the door, goes outside, and Kim does not hear it. Do you believe this or do you not believe this? I do believe this. And also, they had been drinking. They had been dancing. She was probably exhausted. And you know, like when you're in La La Land, you have the best sleep ever. I agree with you. And I think that it's probably easy to open that door. So now that I'm looking at this, I could see a world in which Elliot's in the bathroom and someone else opens the door and has direct, immediate access to him. He is vulnerable. He is brushing his goddamn teeth. He is vulnerable. His guard is so down because he is in La La Land. They may have just forgotten to lock the door. And it may be that he was followed by the police or by someone that the police sent to go give him a shakedown, this cocky lawyer or whatever. They opened the door, maybe grab him, hit him, hit him, hit him, push him. But whatever it was, it must have happened so fast because Kim wasn't awakened. There wasn't a scream. Which brings me to my next theory. Okay, my next theory is, it sounds more likely to me that if whoever did come was yeah, coming to kill. I agree. So theory number three, another thing that we have to do is explore every angle. I don't want to do this. It doesn't feel good for me to do this, but I have to just say this. What if Kim did it? I think that is an important question to ask because like you said at the beginning of this episode, it's often the spouse. It's Yeah, it's usually the spouse. So I just looked up some stats. And in the case of domestic homicides, which like includes murders with intimate relationships like a spouse or a partner, around one in five homicide victims are killed by an intimate partner. One in five. So did Kim do it? Did Kim do it? First of all, we would have to think of a motive if Kim did it. It's not money. They have the same job. They make the same salary. They, by all accounts, including the couple that had met them earlier that day, they were in love and happy and just living life. Now, the official report on the autopsy that was conducted in Mexico said that it was aggravated homicide. And the family, Kim's family and Elliot's family and their whole community, they still believe that he is, quote, the victim of a brutal crime. All right? So there was a GoFundMe set up that I mentioned earlier that was helping in this private investigation. There are many updates on the GoFundMe. I will put the link on our blog on truecrimetravelers.com so you can go through and read all these details and what the family has to say. And in one part, in one part of the updates, they list the only, quote unquote, the only real facts that are known are this. And I'm going to list some of the known facts that the family knows through their investigation, okay, is that. Elliot and Kim had stayed at Los Rocas Resort and Spa on multiple occasions in the past five years. Elliot was a fluent Spanish speaker. Additionally, Elliot and Kim had stayed in this specific room on the third floor on multiple occasions, meaning that Elliot was very familiar with the layout of Los Rocas Resort and Spa, as well as its hallways and walkways. And obviously they're saying this because they do not believe it's a fall. The next point that they make, the incident did not occur off their room's private balcony, nor any balcony for that matter. The three more, there's three more facts. Elliot was not intoxicated at the time of this incident. Elliot was found in his underwear, his sleeping t-shirt, and his socks. And little to no investigation into the circumstances into Elliot's death was conducted by the Rosarito Police Department. So basically saying, this was not an accident. What they say did not happen. The investigation was shitty. They believe it was a crime. I believe it was a crime as well. So what do you guys think? As I always say, Amelia and I don't have all the answers, but we want them. Please visit us at truecrimetravelers.com. Go to the blog. Write your theories in the comments. Read other people's theories. Share information. You can always send us information that we don't have at our email, hola at truecrimetravelers.com. So in conclusion to this, there are 
two to three most likely theories. It was either a tragic accident. It was a targeted robbery or murder from an angry cop or someone, or it was his wife. So what do you guys think? What are we missing here? What are we missing? Because we still don't have answers and neither do they. Now, the GoFundMe was very successful and the family is very grateful. They said that your contributions have assisted with getting Elliot home, funeral costs, investigation, legal costs, and the private autopsy. And you guys, I haven't been able to find much on the private autopsy. So if you have that, please email it to me. I would love to find it. They say that any remaining funds will be applied towards the ongoing investigation, return of their mutual property from Mexico, like she didn't even get to bring her stuff home, and shared home expenses because now Kim lives alone. They bought their dream home in Orange, California, and now she is the only person I can't imagine. The family has set up, however, you guys, they have set up an NGO. They said, we want to honor Elliot's life by continuing his legacy and dedication to at-risk youth involved in the juvenile justice system. We're pleased to announce the launch of the Elliot Blair Foundation, a nonprofit organization with the purpose of the foundation to continue Elliot's legacy by providing youth scholarships and resources to those who have lost loved ones in foreign countries. I love that. So they truly understand how difficult it is, not just dealing with a loved one that's passed, but in an investigation. And then how do you you pick up the pieces? So the GoFundMe no longer accepts donations, but any further help would be so welcomed at the ElliotBlairFoundation.com. And it's Elliot with two L's, E-L-L-I-O-T, BlairFoundation.com. And we will put the link in the show notes. Before we wrap up, as we do in every episode, we want to talk about what can we take away from what happened to Elliot Blair and Kim Williams Blair in Mexico. The travel lesson of the day for me is simple but crucial especially traveling in La La Land. Always remember to keep your doors closed and locked, especially when staying in a familiar place. Just because it's familiar doesn't mean that you can let down all sense of safety. We talk about this a lot in the podcast. Routines will get you. People like routines. They follow routines. If you come here often, let's say that you know, someone knows you often and they get to know that, oh, this is a frequent traveler, frequent money spender, even though they seem really nice, they might be putting a target on your back. So no matter where you are traveling, please take a few extra precautions. Whether you're on the ground floor or the top floor, secure your room. It's a small step that can help keep you safe. Amelia and I recently did a tutorial with this gadget. We were at her parents' house for Christmas and we did this tutorial of this portable door alarm that you set in your door and you close it and then you lock it. But if somehow someone gets through, this alarm goes off. And we'll show you how to use it on this episode's blog at truecrimetravelers.com. And do you want to know where we're going next week? Uh, Yeah. We are going to one of the most mysterious places on earth. We're going to North Korea. Oh my God. Yeah. So you're going to want to come back here next week because that story is crazy. And fun fact, my ex-boyfriend actually went on this trip. Tell you guys more next week. This podcast delves into true crime cases. And we want to remind our listeners that all individuals mentioned are presumed innocent until proven guilty. The opinions expressed here are solely those of myself and Amelia. We strive to research thoroughly and provide accurate and up-to-date information, but please be aware that some details may evolve over time. We encourage you to do your own research and verify the information presented. Thanks for listening. Travel friends are real friends. 